Hello guys, I'm Dr. Ranchan, your pharmacology faculty at Mayro and I welcome all of you to today's discussion of uh, the recall questions of NEET PG 2023 pharmacology. And guys, uh, I'd also like to congratulate all of those who have got a good rank and those students who have not got a good rank and those who are preparing for another time, next time, next NEET PG exam or the freshers who are preparing for NEET PG exams. This uh, session is for those guys. So, so you can understand what to expect in your next exam or the next NEET exam, whatever is going to happen and how the questions are being asked nowadays, how the questions are distributed, how many are easy one, how many are difficult or moderate one and based upon that, how can you plan your preparation. So like guys, let's get down to the business. So guys, let's begin with the discussion of questions. But before I move on to the questions, let me tell you a little bit about the types of questions which are asked. So total number of questions which we could recall from pharmacology is 18. And out of those 18 questions, three were really difficult, right? Four were on the moderate side, easy were 11. So for the future aspirants who are uh, watching this video, I'll, I'd like to explain to you guys how these questions the play a role in a competitive exam. So the easy ones, everyone guys, everyone who has prepared seriously, they do it right, which means what in these easy questions, you should have an efficacy of 100% or at least near 100%, like 90, 99% at least, right? If you'll do too much mistakes in these easy ones, you're out of the race. Now, coming to these ones, the difficult or moderate ones, here, you know, the efficacy rate, you should have around 70 to 80% of questions you should be able to do right, right? And because obviously the difficult and moderate one, you're bound to do some mistakes that is allowed, but you should try to solve as much as possible. And the difficult ones, one or two questions, if you don't know the answer, just leave them. Just leave them. The reason being the negative marking is gonna hurt you, right? Now, how can I solve these easy questions? See, if I, if I do the PYQs and the topics of PYQs, I can easy, easily solve these, these questions, 11 ones, right? But for these questions which are difficult or moderate to difficult ones, for that I need to have a detailed understanding of the topic. I need to know each and every nook and corner of the topic that is being asked, right? So I'll talk about these questions with due course of time. Now coming to the first question, guys. Look at this question. A patient presented with anxiety, restlessness, tremor and fever. His blood pressure is high. Atrial fibrillation is in the ECG. He also has a history of asthma. What drug, what drug should be given next? Now see, as you know, nowadays the MCQs, they have become more clinical, right? And for many questions, you'll feel as if you're not solving an MCQ, rather you're treating a patient and it is the same case. So first of all, you're gonna need a make a diagnosis. When the patient has these symptoms, what is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is guys thyroid storm, right? And whenever a patient is suffering from thyroid storm, the drug of choice in thyroid storm is obviously propyl thioerosol, right? Now, see, if you have a shallow knowledge of the topic, looking at this much, you will go for the answer and many students, they did so, they went for the answer as PTU. Now, is this answer right or wrong? We will see. Now, see, what have I taught you guys? Whenever a patient is suffering from thyroid storm, indeed the anti-thyroid drug of choice is PTU, but the first drug that is given to the patient is not PTU. The first drug that is given to the patient is a beta blocker like propranolol. Now propranolol is the preferred beta blocker because it also inhibits peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. I can also use other beta blockers like esmolol. Now, based upon this, Based upon this, there were many students, they will mark. So PTU is not the answer. The first drug that I'm going to give here is propranolol. Now, why do I give propranolol as the first drug? The reason being, in the patient of thyroid storm, there's a high risk of atrial fibrillation. And this patient already has atrial fibrillation. And you know, in the patients of atrial fibrillation, whenever there is atrial fibrillation, my aim is to block the AV node. And why do I need to block the AV node in atrial fibrillation? Just go back to, you know, CVS, cardiovascular system. And remember, what did I say? In atrial fibrillation, see, atrial fibrillation is not going to kill the patient. The problem is, if this atrial fibrillation, it comes to the ventricle, 
It can cause ventricular fibrillation and cardiac arrest and that is how your patient can die. So in other words, in atrial fibrillation, my aim is to prevent the action potential from coming from the atrium to the ventricle and for that I have to block the AV node. Now what are the AV nodal blockers I have? You know, A, B, C, D. Adenosine, beta blocker, calcium channel blockers like DLTSM, Verapamil and D4 digoxin. We have studied this in the topic of cardiovascular system, right? We have four drugs and the sequence of preference is also A, B, C, D. Now if you remember, I've told you one thing. A and B, that is adenosine and beta blockers, they can cause bronchoconstriction. They can cause bronchoconstriction. And that is the reason why they are not to be given in patient of asthma. Now, in this question, does our patient has asthma? Yes, he has. Can I give A and B? No. So, even propranolol cannot be the answer. Now, many students, they went with asmolol for the answer. Now, why? What did they think? Uh, marking asmolol as an answer. They thought that asmolol is a cardioselective beta blocker. It cannot worsen asthma, guys. That is wrong. In autonomic nervous system, I've taught you, cardioselectivity with beta blocker is not absolute, which means what? Even non-selective beta blockers, like asmolol, it blocks beta 1 more than beta 2. Right? Asmolol is cardioselective. It does not mean it does not block beta 2. That means even cardioselective beta blockers can worsen bronchial asthma. Though the risk would be higher with drugs like propranolol. So here, even asmolol is not the answer. So A is gone, B is gone. What's come? What comes next? C, verapamil or diltiazem. Now, do we have any one of these in option? Yes, I have diltiazem. So guys, what is the answer here? It is D for diltiazem is the answer here. Now, I can see there were many students who messaged me, sir, we, we marked diltiazem because we remember this A, B, C, D. The logic, chronological order. So this is what I mean to say. This is not an exact repeat of any exam. Right? So this is an MCQ which you cannot solve just by mugging up PYQs. Right? So for this, you need to have a detailed understanding of what is thyroid storm. And whenever there is atrial fibrillation in thyroid storm, how am I going to deal it? What are the drugs I have in the options? And how I can use them? Right? So this is one question, guys. Your answer is DTSM. Pretty simple. Now coming to the next question guys, a chronic smoker is taking nicotine therapy and clonidine tablets for smoking de addiction. He stopped taking clonidine tablets and developed headache. What is the reason behind this? Postural hypotension, rebound hypertension, receptor upregulation, receptor hypersensitivity. Now again, a PYQ was asked related to this, but now I will demonstrate how relying only on PYQ can be detrimental. Now look at this. Let me explain to you first of all, what is the receptor, you know, uh, up regulation and down regulation. So normally what happens, suppose this is a synapse, right? This is a synapse. And in this synapse, suppose uh, we are having two receptors, right? Now what is receptor up regulation and what is receptor down regulation? Now what happens is, for example, if I block if I block a receptor for too long, if I block a receptor for too long, what happens is this post synaptic membrane will retaliate and upregulate the production of receptors. So try to understand this. Whenever I block the receptors for too long, number of receptors will increase and this is called as receptor up regulation. This is called as receptor up regulation. Similarly, let me draw another synapse, another synapse and suppose these are the receptors I have. And what happens if I stimulate the receptor, if I stimulate the receptor for too long? So if I give drugs and stimulate these receptors for too long, in that case, what happens? These receptors, they begin to move inside and the number of receptors on this membrane will decline. And this is called as receptor down regulation. So it's pretty simple concept. Too much of block will upregulate the receptor. Too much of stimulation will down regulate the receptor. It's a basic concept you need to understand. Now what happens? is if I go here with respect, let us talk about this drug, clonidine. 
let us talk about this uh, clonidine. Now, what is clonidine? Let me draw a synapse. It's an alpha 2 agonist, all of you know. Alpha 2. Alpha 2 receptors. So, let us suppose these are the alpha 2 receptors we have. These are the alpha 2. This, this is the army of alpha 2 receptors I have. And alpha 2 receptors are on the presynaptic membrane. Here, we have norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter which should be released usually into the synapse and that would act upon alpha 1 and produce vasoconstrict, uh, vasoconstriction. So normally norepinephrine is released, acts upon alpha 1 and produces vasoconstriction. Now see what happens, alpha 2 is a GI subtype of GPCR and what is clonidine? What is clonidine? It is an alpha 2 agonist. So what clonidine does, it stimulates alpha 2 receptor and being inhibitory subtype, it blocks release of norepinephrine, no norepinephrine, no action upon alpha 1 and that produces vasodilatation and that is why clonidine, it is used for treatment of hypertension. We use it for treatment of hypertension, right? We use it for treatment of hypertension and because of this vasodilatation, a side effect can be postural hypertension. So, clonidine can cause postural hypertension as a side effect whenever it is used for any disease like hypertension. Now, what happens when I give clonidine for long term? Now, try to understand this. If I give clonidine for long term, if I give clonidine for long term, if I give clonidine for long term, in that case, continuous stimulation causes what? I told you, right? Continuous stimulation. Cardinal stimulation causes what? Receptor down regulation. If I give clonidine for long term, then what happens? This receptor alpha 2 will begin to move in. So, long term use of clonidine will cause alpha 2 down regulation. Alpha 2 down regulation. So, just imagine a patient is on long term therapy. A patient is on long-term therapy with clonidine and because of long-term use alpha-2 receptors they are down-regulated. Alpha-2 receptors are down-regulated. Now what happens after this when I stop clonidine? Now I've stopped clonidine. Now what's going to happen? See normally, normally so what's going to happen? Let us see. This is my synapse. In this synapse the number of alpha-2 is decreased. I have lesser alpha-2 and this is norepinephrine which is released which acts upon alpha 1. Now because of down regulation now what happens most of my alpha 2 receptors are present where inside the neuron they have been degraded they have been down regulated and now what happens when I stop when I stop clonidine then in this case what's going to happen just try to understand whenever norepinephrine is released alpha 2 is not only target for norepinephrine uh, sorry clonidine Norepinephrine also binds to alpha 2. Norepinephrine also binds to alpha 2 and because of which because of which alpha 2 stimulation blocks release of norepinephrine. So norepinephrine controls its own release. Norepinephrine controls its own release by alpha 2. Now what happens if the number of alpha 2 is decreased? If the number of alpha 2 is decreased then the decrease in norepinephrine decrease is nor epinephrine release is not adequate and because of this because of this a huge amount of nor epinephrine would be released because the break is gone and this nor epinephrine will act upon alpha 1 will act upon alpha 1 and this will cause something called as withdrawal hypertension or it is also known as rebound hypertension Right, so withdrawal hypertension or rebound hypertension that is seen with clonidine is because of alpha 2 down regulation. So this was the PYQ. Couple of years back they had asked you what is the cause of withdrawal hypertension. Alpha 2 down regulation is the answer, right? It was the answer. Now what they have asked, look at this question. If you would have mugged up this MCQ, then you would have gone for something regulation. See down regulation is not there. Here there is receptor up regulation. Many students went for this as answer. Will this be my answer? No. Up regulation cannot be the answer. The answer has to be down regulation. It's not there. So what is my answer here? 
My answer here is rebound hypertension. Right, so it is an MCQ that is related to a PYQ. But if you'll just mug up the PYQs, you'll not be able to solve this. You have to understand what is rebound hypertension and why it happens is because of receptor, receptor downregulation. So clonidine causes receptor alpha 2 downregulation, number of alpha 2 decreases, and because of which norepinephrine cannot or can no longer regulate its own release. And that is the reason why what happens here is called as withdrawal or rebound hypertension. Postural hypertension will not be the answer because it is a side effect of clonidine. It is not seen because of stopping clonidine, right? So see, stop taking clonidine. So when I take clonidine, it causes postural hypertension. When I stop taking clonidine, it causes hypertension. That is called as rebound hypertension, right? So this is an important MCU guys. Second, uh, moving on to the next question. A patient was started on dialysis and he developed disequilibrium. He developed disequilibrium. Which of the following drugs should be started? See, this MCQ has never been asked in your exams. But dialysis disequilibrium is something which I have taught you. I have taught you in the topic of diuretics. I have taught you this in the topic of diuretics. And in the topic of diuretics, I have told you one of the uses of diuretic, Manitol. So, Manitol, I have told you around four uses. And one of the uses of Manitol, one of the uses of Manitol is dialysis disequilibrium. I've taught you that and that is an uh, answer. So see, if I do just PYQs, I'll not be able to solve this question. I have to go through the videos and my notes so that I can solve such type of new questions, right? So if you want, want to get a good rank, you have to solve such questions. Now coming to dialysis disequilibrium. What is this dialysis disequilibrium? Let us try to understand. See, what happens in dialysis disequilibrium is normally what dialysis does, what dialysis does, dialysis, it removes uric acid. It removes uric acid and if this removal of uric acid is in excess, this creates a problem. Now why removal of uric acid in excess can cause problem? Right, remember, uric acid is osmotic. Is osmotic means whenever your plasma has uric acid, it holds water in your systemic circulation. Now, when that is removed, what happens? Osmotic pressure decreases. It is decreased. And when osmotic pressure decreases because of too much of removal of uric acid by dialysis, what happens is because of decreased osmotic pressure, water begins to move from plasma into your neuronal cells. And that can result in cerebral edema. So the symptoms of dialysis disequilibrium, they are quite similar to the symptoms of cerebral edema. And if you know, what is the drug of choice for cerebral edema? It's Manitol, isn't it? So guys, Manitol is the answer here and dialysis disequilibrium. Now that is, it has been asked, obviously you will remember, but this has been asked for the first time. So I told you, this is one of the difficult MCQs. So I'm discussing the difficult ones and the moderate ones to begin with. Later, I'll tell you the easy ones, right? So here, Manitol is the answer. Manitol is the answer, guys. So Manitol uses are very important. And see, uses you can remember as A, B, C, D, E. So I'll just, I'm just revising. A for acute congestive glaucoma. B for breaking of diuretics. Breaking of diuretic means when there is resistance to diuretics. C for cerebral edema. D for dialysis disequilibrium. E for expected renal failure or it is also known as impending renal failure. Remember, Manitol is never used in renal failure. But if it is expected to prevent renal failure, to acutely increase the urine output, I can use it before renal failure, but not after renal failure, right? So A, B, C, D, E is easier to remember. Now coming to the next question, a patient comes to casualty with consumption of uh, organophosphate pesticide, IV atropine infusion and pralidoxime given. After two hours, the patient had a sudden rise in temperature. What is the cause of this fever? Now see, I'll discuss two MCQs, two MCQs together. This is one question, right? Options are pralidoxime side effect, atropine toxicity, idiopathic OP poisoning. Second, unknown food consumption by child, odd behavior, fever. Again, what is common is fever and low urine output, causative fruit and treatment. Datura, uh, Pralidoxim, Datura, Physostegmin, Yellow Oleander, Digibind, Yellow Oleander, Physostegmin. 
So what is common in these two questions is temperature or fever, right? And you will see that both these questions are related to each other. How is that? Let us try to understand. Uh, guys, uh, this is something I have taught you in your uh, autonomic number system that you know that in the sympathetic in the sympathetic nervous system, the neurotransmitter is norepinephrine. I, I always tell you this, right? But there is some exception to this. And the exception, one exception, I'll not discuss all the exceptions. One, acetylcholine in the sweat glands. So in the sweat glands, right? So in the sweat glands, sweat glands, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. We are talking about sweating here. So let me draw uh, a neuron. Suppose this is a neuron of sympathetic nervous system sympathetic nervous system right sympathetic nervous system now it supplies the sweat glands suppose this is one of your sweat glands right but what is a neurotransmitter it is a fiber this fiber is sympathetic nervous system fiber but what is a neurotransmitter is it norepinephrine no the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine now if the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine can my receptor can my receptor be alpha or beta no my receptor has to be muscarinic and the receptor here that is present in the sweat glands is M3. So how sweating happens? See, how sweating happens? Whenever sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, suppose you are having a flight or fight reaction, whenever sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, it would stimulate this fiber and that would induce release of acetylcholine. That would stimulate M3 receptor and this would cause sweating this would cause sweating so one statement one statement sweating is caused by which nervous system sympathetic nervous system right look at the second statement can sympatholytics block sweating true or false what do you think what do you think let me know in the comment box what do you think can sympatholytics block sweating no so remember it's a very contradictory statement isn't it sympathetic nervous system causes sweating but sympatholytics cannot block sweating. The reason being the neurotransmitter. See, the system is sympathetic, but the neurotransmitter and receptor is from parasympathetic nervous system. So to block sweating, I have to block M3 receptor by drugs like atropine. So atropine is a drug that can block M3 and because of which it can block sweating. Now, what is the physiological role of sweating? Why God has given us sweating so that we can sweat and regulate the body temperature. You know the basic physics, whenever water evaporates from the surface, the surface becomes cooler. So our body temperature is regulated by sweating. What if I, I block sweating? If I block sweating, then my temperature will increase. My temperature will increase, right? What are the compounds which have atropine-like compounds? These are compounds like Datura, Belladonna, they have atropine-like compounds. Guys, this is a very basic concept that I've taught you. Now, if you know this much, from this very basic concept, you could have solved not one, but two questions. Not one, but two questions. And these are, say, look at this patient. It has sudden rise in temperature after he was giving atropine infusion and pralidoxime. Whose side effect is this? Now, you know the answer better than me. What is the answer? The answer is atropine toxicity as simple as that second question unknown fruit consumed by a child or behavior now the catch word here what is the catch word the catch word is fever 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 the patient has fever and low urine output what is the causative fruit and treatment causative fruit and treatment all of you know by now it has to be datura but datura it has atropine like compounds and what is the drug of choice for atropine toxicity datura toxicity or belladonna poisoning is physostigmine, right? Physostigmine. So the answer is B. Your answer is B, physostigmine. Now see, yellow oleander, if they would ask you ever, yellow oleander, I use digibine because yellow oleander, it is toxic, right? And uh, it has uh, digoxin-like compounds. It also has digitalis, right? Digitalis and digoxin-like compounds. And if there is a toxicity of yellow oleander, it will mimic with digoxin toxicity. There would be arrhythmia, etc., etc. would be seen. For that, I can use digibind. But in this case, fever. So fever, 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 temperature, rising temperature, fever, fever. Answer is what? Atropine or datura poisoning, physostigmine. As simple as that, right? Now, 
Coming to the next question, a bronchial asthma patient on inhalational steroids with white patchy lesion on the tongue and buccal mucosa, what drug is used to treat? Now, again, this is not a PYQ, right? Earlier, they have asked you, see, all of you know what is this? This is a case of oral candidiasis, isn't it? What is this? What is this? Oral candidiasis. It has never been asked in your exam. But they have indeed asked you, they have asked you what is the drug of choice for candidiasis? Your answer is fluconazole. For candidiasis, drug of choice is fluconazole is a drug of choice for candida. But if you remember, I've told you there are few, you know, uh, conditions applied. To the statement when I say drug of choice is fluconazole for candida few conditions applied. What are those conditions guys? What are those conditions? If you remember I told you one condition is it is drug of choice only for mucocutaneous, mucocutaneous like esophageal candidiasis, vaginal and uh, for uh, your cystitis. But I've taught you this, there is one exception and that exception is oral candidiasis. Now you can check the lectures I've told you. If it is oral candidiasis, then my drug of choice becomes clotrimazole. We can use lozenge. So lozenge, we use clotrimazole. The patient will suck the lozenge for local effect and it would, it would have better efficacy. Now I can also use fluconazole. I'm not saying I cannot use, but the preferred drug is clotrimazole. So one condition is candida is mucocutaneous except uh, oral. And second is uh, only for albicans, only for albicans, so candida albicans, other like cruse, glabrata, parapsilosis, fluconazole is not effective. Now see, this is what I have taught you guys and from this, so it's a moderate level difficulty question. If I have not read, then many students, they went with uh, flu cytosine, tabinafine, this is not the answer guys, the answer is clotrimazole. Many students could answer this just because they thought if it is not fluconazole, let us take someone who is like fluconazole and that is clotrimazole. Now there is another way of getting answer. Even if you are not sure, if you have a gut feeling, okay, I know fluconazole, it's not in the option. Let me go with clotrimazole. That's another way of getting a right answer. If you're doing that, there is no sin in it because it's a competitive exam. At the end of the day, we need to get the right answer by hook or crook. Right, so this is the answer guys. An image of this it shows angiotensin 2 synthesis and naprilis action with two arrows on AC and naprilisin, which drug inhibits both these enzymes. So basically, this is what I could recall from the students. They told me that uh, there was one drug that is given this, this drug. It inhibits neutral endopeptidase and ACE and decreases angiotensin 2. Which drug is this? Which drug is this? Now see guys, this drug, it is called as omapatrilat. So, omapatrilate, it is called as a vasopeptidase inhibitor. Vasopeptidase inhibitor. See, I used to teach this drug earlier. I stopped teaching this drug because this drug was uh, stopped. Its development was stopped, right? Now, this question, there are very few students who could answer, right? Who would have studied uh, my older notes. They, 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 they could have answered this. Now, if you, if you cannot solve such a question in exam, right? Then remember, such type of questions, if you cannot solve, then it is okay. They are not rank decider, right? Now, let me tell you a little bit about Oma Patrilat. What is this uh, drug all about? Oma Patrilat was a drug that is that, that, that was uh, being designed for heart failure, thinking that if I can block neutral endopeptidase and if I can block ACE, this can significantly decrease the load on the heart and I can use this in chronic CHF. But the problem is with both this combination there is a high risk of angioedema and because of which this drug's development was stopped. I mean remember it was never ever approved by FDA. So when, when I could not get my head around this what I did I developed two more drugs. I developed Sacubitril and again it is a blocker of NEP. I know that 
I cannot use an ACE inhibitor. So what I did, I combined Valsat and Tuvit. What is Valsat? It is an ARB. So all of you know about this. Nowadays, I teach this. I teach this one because this one is used. And I told you that Secubitril is something. This, this I have taught you. It is contraindicated with ACE inhibitor. And why it is contraindicated with ACE inhibitors? For same reason. For the reason of causing what? Angioedema. So anyways, uh, this drug should not have been asked because it does not give you any extra knowledge. They should have rather asked you about Secubitril Valsatan because this is what is being used nowadays. But anyways, guys, we cannot argue with the examiners, right? So here, our answer is Oma Petrilite, guys. Oma Petrilite, right? So see, blood pressure, cardiac performance, target organ effects is about heart failure. Now coming to this. So until now, the questions which I had discussed, the seven questions, they are moderate to difficulty level questions. They are the rank deciders. The question which I'm about to discuss, the remaining 11 questions, they're easy ones. They will make sure you are in the race, but they will not make you a winner in the race. But these are very important because I need to have a 100% efficacy to be in the race. A young female comes to emergency after consuming 100 tablets of aspirin. What should be given next in the management? Guys, here your answer is sodium bicarbonate to alkalinize urine. Now this, I have something, this I have taught you this in your uh, lectures that there is something called as uh, drug ionization and for a drug to be ionized the pH should be different if I want a drug to be ionized the pH should be different now whose pH the pH of the drug and the medium it should be different so it, which means what if there is an acidic drug the medium must be basic and then only drug would be ionized and it can be excreted it would facilitate what excretion. Now let's talk about an acidic drug like aspirin. Now this is something I teach you. Aspirin is an acidic drug and if I want to increase excretion of aspirin what I can do I can make the urine basic. I can make the urine basic and how do I make the urine basic by giving what? Bicarbonate. So almost most of the students they would have done this right. Nobody was Upset with this question, all were happy because it's an easy question. I use bicarbonate, and your answer is give sodium bicarbonate to alkalinize the urine. Right? So it's a simple one, guys. There is nothing much to explain. A physician prescribed a drug to reduce synthesis of uric acid for gout. Identify the drug. Again, guys, your answer is allopurinol. There is nothing much to explain here. Allopurinol, it's a xanthine oxidase inhibitor, and xanthine oxidase inhibitor. They block synthesis of uric acid. So gout drugs are pretty simple. They ask you which drug blocks uric acid synthesis. What is the drug of choice for acute gout? These are all PYQs. It's a very simple, it's the easiest of the possible MCQs that was asked in this neat PG. Right. Drug contraindicated in asthma patient in management of postpartum hemorrhage. Now see guys, in asthma patient in postpartum hemorrhage, I should not be using carboprost. Carboprost, it is a prostaglandin F2 alpha analog and these receptors, they are present in the bronchi and these are GQ subtype of GPCRs. So carbo carboprost, by acting upon these GQ receptors in the bronchi by increasing calcium can precipitate bronchoconstriction. So I should never use carboprost, carboprost. Again, this is not a difficult one, carboprost, most of you guys have answered this correct, correct because see many people could rule out that ergometrine oxytocin they have nothing to do here right but prostaglandins they do contract smooth muscle like uterus bronchi so answer could be either carboprost or dinoprostone so by that i am i am left with two options so many people went for carboprost some went for dinoprostone dinoprostone does not worsen bronchial asthma because the prostaglandin see Dinoprostone is prostaglandin E2 and prostaglandin E2 receptors are not present in the bronchi. So it's not the answer. Your answer is A, that is carboprost, right? Now let us look at the next question, guys. A patient was given digoxin, started having side effects like nausea, vomiting, serum concentration was 4 nanograms per ml, 
plasma therapeutic range is 1 nanograms per ml, half life of rejoxin is 40 hours. What time is required till you can safely start rejoxin again? Now, I know that you guys hate numericals and even uh, some of you guys would skip numericals just like that even without giving one second thought, right? But on the outset, it might look difficult. But if you little bit invest yourself into this question, it's a pretty easy one. What is the question asking? From 4 to 1, how much time would be taken? From 4 nanograms per ml to 1 nanogram per ml, how much time would be taken? Half-life is 40 hours. So it's pretty simple mathematics. It is, in fact, I can say class 4 or 5 mathematics, right? Now, so from, from taking 4 to 2, I need 40 hours. Is 1 half-life? From 2 to 1, I need another 40 hours. There is 2 half-lives. 2 half-lives, right? So to get from 4 to 1, I need 2 half-lives. On the other was how many hours? 8 hours. So tell me, what is so difficult in this? It's not that difficult, right? It's a very easy one. And so actually, I, I did not find that any student messaging me, sir, that um, I could not solve this numerical. Most of you guys have solved it, right? A patient with previous MI ventricular arrhythmia is on treatment since few months. It develops fatigue, dyspnea, weight gain. Look at the symptoms, dyspnea, weight gain, developed pulmonary fibrosis. Which of the following drug causes it? I guess, Am I already wrong? Now this is a PYQ. Uh, possibly I cannot even count how many times it has already been asked for, for the last two decades. Yes, yes. It, it is not that they have been asking. They are, they are, they are, they are asking this only uh, since five years or ten years. They have been asking for the last 20 years. So see, am I already wrong? If you remember, I told you it's a five-star drug, right? And I had given you a list of drugs where MCQs are frequently asked. One is digoxin, one is amiodarone. So amiodarone. Here, the clue is, see, weight gain, that can be seen because he might have developed hypothyroidism, pulmonary fibrosis, that is what is causing dyspnea. So, whatever side effect they ask you, before this, they had asked you about uh, blue-gray pigmentation. Again, they had asked you, which drug causes amiodarone. So, all these MCQs, they are asked. So, amiodarone is an important drug, guys. True statement among the following is, now, see, this is a classical example of how <laughs> you'll have a lot of noise. You can see this much of noise. You can see this much of noise. Right. And looking at these long options, you would be like panicked. And many of you would have thought, do hell with this question. I am not going to attempt this, right? But when there is a lot of noise in an MCQ, just try to focus. Read, read the options. Try to focus. See, can you find something that you know? Okay. You don't know this. You don't know this. You don't know this. Fine, I don't know any of this. I have not read any, anything about the, um, you know, elimination, renal and hepatic. And frankly speaking, it's not even important. But see, look at option C. Losartan blocks thromboxan A2 and inhibits platelet aggregation. This is something I have taught you. And this is a PYQ which has been asked many times. So even if I don't know A, B and D, I still can get the answer option. And frankly speaking, don't jump into mugging up the elimination route for all ARB after this. No, you don't need that, right? So if you remember, I'd given you, so C is the answer, I guess. If you remember, I'd given you uh, Losartan, Losartan, the mnemonic I gave you, Sart put, Sart put, you know, short put, short put, short put. So one is PPAR gamma agonism, another is excretion of uric acid, and another one is block of thromboxan So I gave you these three important ones, which you can remember. Low sartan. And that is the reason why this is the answer. So this is a classical example of how, even if you know one single point, you can find the right answer in an MCQ, which might sound difficult. Mechanism of action of tissue plasminogen activator. Now, what, what else could you ask for? <laughs> how? How easy is this MCU, right? So this is this is something you study in physiology, in pathology, everywhere. Even I teach you, and uh, you know wha how what TPA does? Plasminogen is converted into plasmin, and for that I need something called as TPA or tissue plasminogen activator. And what plasmin does? It breaks fibrin. Now, this is what I begin with. This is this is the physiology that I begin with while I, I teach you guys uh, about fibrinolytics. 
right? Like alter place, recta place, connector place. So mechanism of action of tissue plasminogen activator. Look at this option. Your answer is option C, enhances fibrin degradation. I, I, I rest my case, nothing else to teach here, right? A patient of malignancy, platelet counts were reduced during the previous cycle of chemotherapy. Which will you give this time to prevent or treat this condition, right? So this is thrombocytopenia caused by chemotherapy and this is something I've taught you. Oprilefkin, interleukin 11, the only use of this drug is chemotherapy induced thrombocytopenia. So all of these, they have been asked. Filgrastim, it is used for chemotherapy or HIV induced neutropenia. Erythropoietin is used for chemotherapy induced anemia or zidovudin induced anemia. The most commonly asked is renal failure, CRF induced anemia. We use erythropoietin. These are all PYQs. Amifostin, it's a radio protectant. Many years back, they had asked you once this MCQ, which is a radio protective drug. Amifostin is a free radical scavenger and it protects you from the uh, side effects of radiotherapy. And what are the side effects of radiotherapy and why they are seen? They are seen because of what? Free radical production. So I scavenge those free radicals by giving a drug like amifostin. Again, it's not a difficult one, guys. It's a very simple one. This MCQ. Next one, a patient on haloperidol and thioridazine but not responding and hence was started on a drug that causes hyperglycemia, obesity, salivation, which drug was started? Now see, there is something that I have taught you guys, side effects of antipsychotics and they are because of either D2 receptor block or they are because of other receptor block. I have taught you this, D2 receptor block causes extra pyramidal side effect, hyperprolactinemia. Other receptor block like muscarinic H1, 5S2, alpha 1 causes constipation, dry mouth, sedation, obesity, hypotension plus metabolic side effects like hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia. Two range of side effects. Now, remember a drug a drug, a drug, a drug, a drug which is more potent at D2 will cause more of these side effects whereas it will cause lesser of the other side effects. So if a drug is more potent at these receptors D2, it would be lesser potent at other receptors. So imagine risperidone is most potent out of atypical antipsychotics at D2. So it will cause more of EPS. But because it is more potent at D2, it is less potent at other receptors. So it will cause lesser of all these side effects, risperidone lesser. Clozapine is least potent at D2 among atypicals, so it will cause minimum of these. But because it is less potent at D2, it would be more potent at other receptors and causes maximum of these side effects like obesity, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia. So what is the question here? But see, minimum is risperidone, but it is not seen with these drugs. So you can remember these drugs which are more important. Okay, look at this question. Hyperglycemia, obesity, salivation, what is the answer? The answer is close up in guys. And now, see, again the role of PYQ. One PYQ they had asked you, which of the following atypical antipsychotic causes maximum obesity? This is one MCQ. And your answer was close up in. Now, even if you don't know anything from this PYQ, you could solve this question. You could solve this question, right? Antibiotic to use for procedure done on cardiac patient. Now, again, this is... A point that has been asked many times and this is something which is called as surgical prophylaxis. Surgical prophylaxis. See surgical prophylaxis, the drug of choice for surgical prophylaxis is cefazolin. Usually cefazolin is the drug of choice because see whenever I cut through the skin, the infection on the skin, it could be because of either staphylococcus or streptococcus, isn't it? And cefazolin has good activity against gram-positive aerobes, so it is preferred. Usually, only cefazolin does the job, except if I'm going for colorectal surgery. See here, cardiac patient, so no problem. If there is colorectal surgery, apart from cefazolin, you have to add metronidazole or cefotetan or cefoxetine because these drugs they cover anaerobes so if i'm doing a colorectal surgery you know we have bacteroids in the colorectal part and to cover that anaerobes i have to combine these drugs so it's again an easy question it's not a difficult one and i i hope 
you guys have done must have done all of these correct right 